Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show, recording live on Monday, December 23rd, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. Show notes will be over at healthytalkshow.com forward slash 44. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have racial bias and facial recognition algorithms, and it's confirmed you're being tracked everywhere. But first... The elusive street artist Banksy has created this work titled The Scar of Bethlehem in the Occupied West Bank, which shows Jesus, Mary and Joseph against concrete blocks damaged by mortar shells. The piece can be found in the artist's own hotel in Bethlehem, all rooms of which look out over a concrete section of the barrier which was built by Israel to separate the two territories. Very funny. Yeah. Banksy making a statement. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> On Christmas, or at least the 23rd, Christmas Eve, Eve, we're really close there. CBS Local News slanted toilet design to stop workers from taking long bathroom breaks. This new toilet design is encouraging employees to get off the toilet quickly. A British startup called Standard Toilet came up with a design. The key difference here, the seat is sloped by around 13 degrees. And developers say that it mimics the squat thrust in the user, putting strain on their legs and making them want to get up after about five minutes. They estimate that extend. That's horrible. Yeah. It makes people want to get up after about five minutes. That's, wow. <laughs> That's awful. What if you got a really bad poo? Yeah. It's going to be a really, wow. You really want to take care of your workers there if you buy this toilet. Yeah. Employee breaks cost industries around $5 billion per year in the UK. What? Yeah, that's what the estimate was. Oh, I, don't I don't know. know. How can you quantify you can't. bathroom breaks? And- you can't. But bathroom breaks, are, you know, are very challenging, especially for employers like Amazon. They have a problem, you know. They like to tax their employees for taking long bathroom breaks and discipline them. There were reports of that. Yeah. I think we've covered that throughout the past. That's true. And on the Amazon, what? Oh, I was just going to say, probably also promotes bad, like, poop posture. Yeah. Squatty potty is, people make fun of it. That's actually, I believe the way you're supposed to sit on a toilet, it's supposed to be perched anyway. It's supposed to perch like a bird. That's the most healthy way. So you should actually be sitting on the bowl. Your yeah. legs should be on the bowl. Your feet should be on the bowl, I mean, or on the rim. It yeah. Be on the rim. That's how you should be sitting. But most people can't do that, so that's why you use a squatty potty. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's a, toilets aren't healthy. <laughs> so maybe there's something to this. It's, it's bad. Yeah. Well, this is, yeah. I don't know. Good morning, America. Could your Amazon purchase be coming from the trash? The Wall Street Journal reporting that some third-party sellers on Amazon may be selling actual garbage. Just about anyone can create a storefront on Amazon. But why are Amazon users being fooled into buying trash? According to the Wall Street Journal, buyers believe if it comes in an Amazon box or has an Amazon label, it is in fact sold by Amazon. Do people actually believe that? Hmm. I don't know. That's what yeah. according to the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. That's what they said. So apparently people, all people must believe that. Yeah. Is there a study? Yeah. Where's the study on that one? But that isn't the case. Many third party sellers send their items to fulfillment centers across the country to then be sent by the online retail giant. Rachel Johnson Greer, a former manager of an Amazon fulfillment center, knows the ins and outs and says it's not hard to be fooled. Anything that was inside the fulfillment centers would get the Prime badge because it could be delivered at that speed. So people started equating the Prime badge with Amazon. There are millions of... Br- it's pretty funny. Yeah. That is <laughs> kind of... Yeah. I thought people knew that about the fulfillment thing. <laughs> Maybe not. We need a study. Yep. Brand new items sold on Amazon, but there are also some labeled new that are secondhand. So the journal put the idea to the test. We retrieved items from store dumpsters. We created an Amazon storefront. We listed those items on Amazon. The Wall Street Journal then purchased their own items before anyone else could. What? Yeah. According to Heather Hooks, not everyone sells trash. Ooh, this is a good one. Wait. So, but that was such a weird. Well, yeah, the way to do it. Because then they just bought their own stuff. That doesn't, yeah. That didn't prove anything because sometimes people will, you know, wait for a reputable seller or something. They'll just buy from, uh, yeah. I don't know. Was, yeah. Sorry. That was I, a, kind of a weird test. Yeah. It might be a, a native ad for Amazon. I have no idea. Yeah. There's a lot of Amazon here, but this is Target right here. That's a, that's a video of Target. <laughs> 
Buy a toy after Christmas for $5 and flip it online for $20. In response to the Wall Street Journal report, Amazon updated their policy to ban selling items from the trash and closed the journal's third-party store for violations of their seller policies and seller code of conduct. Amazon also telling ABC News, sellers are responsible for meeting Amazon's high bar for product quality. There were isolated incidents that do not reflect the high-quality customer experience provided by the millions of small businesses selling in our store every day. We will take appropriate action against the bad actors involved, including possible legal action. Uh, yeah you're selling trash on their with their name through their company they're gonna take you yeah you're, that's a bad but, idea how, how big of a problem is this i've never personally heard of anybody yeah. receiving trash through amazon uh now that's, you made me really think that this is just some amazon yeah, ad it's it really might be. weird it might be <laughs> and everyone stop buying from amazon don't trust them bad company yeah think hmm. about it when are they too big they're already there too big that's all I have to say about Amazon. But I don't think they're selling trash. You're getting trash through him. There's a lot of stuff you can say about Amazon, but that yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah, that was a weird story. It's really funny. That's <laughs> uh, Ready for some science, some yeah. anthropology? University of Iowa researchers determine age of last known Homo erectus settlement. Since 2008, I've been working on a site in Java, Indonesia, called Nandong. This has one of the largest collections of Homo erectus fossils found anywhere in the world. The object of our research was to come up with new ways to date the site. We know Homo erectus lived at the site, but the big problem was when did they live there? How old is the site? Our team used five different dating techniques, and these techniques um, allowed us to precisely date the fossils in the terraces, and we came up with a date of 108,000 to 117,000 years ago. During the time period, 108 to 117,000 years ago, Homo sapiens had already evolved in Africa, and we also know that Neanderthals were living in Europe at the time. The, the fossils of Homo erectus from Nandong are by far the youngest Homo erectus found anywhere in the world. That's exciting. Yeah, that is super cool. Yeah. <laughs> Existing at the same time. Yeah. That changes things. I know. Now everyone wants to know, did they meet? Yeah. <laughs> now that's the next question. Yeah. Find Shoot. them together. Ooh. Yeah, but how are you going to stay on top of all the latest science? <laughs> Good segue, but we're still a video. Ah, oh, damn! You're missing. I always miss. You always segue. miss. Oh my god! It's okay. It's okay. One day I'll, I'll we get assume the segues. That Homo erectus on the island of Java, because it was isolated, continued to encephalize. The brain got bigger. Does that mean that Homo erectus on Java was smarter than Homo erectus in Africa? We don't know, but we can certainly document that the brain got big bigger. Very interesting. Yeah. And then climate change destroyed. Destroyed it all. Uh, ready to move on? <laughs> climate change. <laughs> Natural climate change. Natural climate change. That is true. I don't know why they left that out of that video. <laughs> they really did. They, that was like in the report, but it's cool. Yeah. I, I thought it was kind of funny that it was like a big deal, the report, but. <laughs> yeah. But they don't yeah. actually mention that part in the video. Natural climate change was apparently what. Uh, Eliminated them. Yeah. On that island. Yeah. Pretty interesting, though. Yeah. Very interesting science. And it's very cool. They actually published this in Nature. Oh, that yeah, is awesome. The last appearance of Homo erectus at Nagdon. I don't actually have it, but yeah, they published it in Nature. I just saw that connected the two. Because you were going to mention something about yeah. something. Yeah. Why, why couldn't you, you get the Nature article? <laughs> well, <laughs> nature. Rumors fly about changes to U.S. government open access policy. The White House is said to be preparing a policy that would change how government-funded research is disseminated. Yeah, so everyone's Very interesting. talking about, so if you remember, uh, I think it was under Obama, they changed the rule that federally funded research had to be open and available to the public 12 months after publication. Mm-hmm. 
And so now there's rumors going around that they want to change that from 12 months to immediately, immediately available. But people are kind of freaking out about this already, even though it's just a rumor. Yeah, well, it's a rumor, but <laughs> yeah. American Institute of Physics scientific publishers unite to oppose potential open access executive order. So this is what started piquing our interest, because first we hear rumor, 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 but then this is an opposition article talking about, I really don't know what the opposition is to it. Well, most of the opposition, as you can imagine, comes from the publishing companies, their argument is that people don't really understand the true value that these publishing companies provide. That's why they need the subscription-based mm -hmm. kind of service, and that's why they need it embargoed. Yeah. And they claim that, you know, most people have journal access, or most people yeah. that need it. Okay, this is, this is the stance that we, I think we should all take as taxpayers, because this is real easy, real easy. This is federally funded, taxpayer-funded research. If I'm paying for it, I should have access to the research. Yeah. So I don't know why they're, well, how is there any opposition to that? I, that's that, weird. And, and that's what the scientists are usually saying. Cause yeah. as scientists, we're all about disseminating the research. That's yeah. part of the scientific method. Open the gates. But if people can't access it and it's behind all these paywalls, well, and they're paying for it. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. Letter of concern from chairman subcommittee on intellectual property. Yeah. About December 12, 2019. The only thing that I found kind of funny is here he says, my understanding is this executive order would mandate that scientific journal articles be made available immediately. But he kind of left out the wording that we've been familiar with of the federally yeah. funded, because I think that's really key here. Yes. Because it all goes back to the people paid for it. Yeah. If the people paid for it, there's no, there should be no restriction to it, except, you know, military and defense stuff. That's an argument to be made there. Yeah. But, but for just... <laughs> That's just silly. These publishing companies are middlemen, it sounds like, and they're just trying to get keep yeah. their monies low in. He's talking about it's going to endanger the quality, but it, it doesn't make sense because the articles are already peer-reviewed, but professors are not paid to peer-review. That's just part of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. Where's my check for reviewing that? Yeah. Uh, okay, now we have an old article from Nature dated March 27, 2013. Nature Open Access, the true cost of science publishing. This is what you're talking about. It's extremely expensive to publish. Yeah, and the other issue is, so we don't know a lot about the publishing industry or how much money they make, so they make a lot of guesstimations. Yes, it's a little bit older article, but mm, yeah, it's, it's nature, so it's, it, <laughs> it's pretty factual. Reputable. Yeah. yeah. And so they're kind of arguing, you know, is it worth it? Because they're kind of debating in this paper, what's the cost of publishing? Can we switch to an open access model mm -hmm. where, you know, your grant funds go to also publishing? So let's, we can skip ahead. So there's a main kind of chart. Mm -hmm. And right now, kind of there's this price of prestige where people think that the best journals and the ones that are, kind of scored the highest as having the most influential. They're also kind of subscription-based and not as open access. And that's where these open access journals kind of get a bad reputation, mm -hmm. is maybe they're not as good, but I don't think that it has to be that way because there's plenty of arguments that is still peer-reviewed. And then if you look at the cost breakdown, yeah, <laughs> so you can see there's a lot of costs with the subscription base because they have a lot more overhead. A lot more people working for them. For what? That's... With the internet and the power of... It's not... We don't need this anymore. They have... There's no reason for them to even... It's just barriers. It's co it's paywalls yeah. to information. And this is... They're outdated and, mechanisms. Right. And then it, it goes back to that elitism that... Oh. Yes. Now, I can't access any of this stuff myself. Yeah. Being Robert from Healthy Talk Show. I have no access. And some people may even say, oh, you're too uneducated to read it. But that's also bull Yeah, a lot crap. of people feel that way. Yeah, feel and, that, oh. and we've, we've heard academics say yeah, this. Yeah, we've heard academics say that. that oh, that people, the public doesn't need to read. No. Yeah. Everybody needs to read. Yeah. Because somebody will see, everyone will see something different and we can all pick apart things mm -hmm. our own way. We're, we all decipher information a little bit differently. Yeah. Plus, yeah. you want to know what your tax dollars are going yeah, for. Yeah, and see if it's being spent wisely or not. Yeah. It's another issue. 
And not a lot of universities and research institutions can afford these subscriptions. They're all very costly. Yeah. So, get rid of the paywalls. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, healthytalkshow.com slash support. We don't have paywalls. Nice. Yep. NIST. Study evaluates effects of race, age, sex on face recognition software. And NBC did a cool piece. Federal study finds racial and gender bias in facial recognition algorithms. They did a cool video. It's some cool VR stuff in a New York apartment, looks like. Part one. What does AI facial recognition... No. What does an AI facial recognition program look for first? There we go. Well, there are lots of methodologies that we can look at, one in particular called open face. The first thing it needs to do is find out whether there's even a face in the photo. And it does that by looking for 68 different facial landmarks that typically represent uh, what we would think of as a visibly human face. Within those 68 different groupings, we're looking for edges or gradients. And the edges typically represent a group of pixels that's the same color or that shifts from a darker color to a lighter one. In the open face paper, there's uh, particularly eight different landmarks that represent a human eye, and many others comprise an eyebrow or a mouth or a nose, anything along those lines that you might see when you look in the mirror. Well, now that we know we have a human face, the goal is to get it into a format that's uniform. And using these 68 points as anchors, we can then scale or rotate or even adjust the angle of the individual's face. So this is gonna allow the program to be able to make it bigger or rotate it a couple degrees and still be able Dang. to effectively understand yeah it's pretty scary Sorry, that, this gets really scary because you start understanding yeah because you're showing on the screen how you can rotate and enlarge yeah. this so yeah the zoom and enhance stuff is starting to become reality yeah and unfortunately it so many angles yeah and what it's looking at exactly we want every face that we're trying to predict on to be effectively similar enough that we know things are in the same spot the challenges come in whenever your training data is different from what you're trying to predict so that could mean if all your training data is done in low light and you have a really sunny day then it's going to be really difficult to predict a match if it's a, something as simple as you have on a pair of sunglasses that removes a lot of the landmarks and makes it a lot harder to predict well, the next step is to try to extract information from that face. And we do that by passing the photo through a neural net. Each layer, until the last one, is going to try to extract features and then represent them in a mathematical form. Dang. Yeah, very fancy <laughs> and very, a lot of words. Yeah. But it's pretty cool, cool visual representation of kind of how it might work if your computer, your mind was a computer, I suppose. And yeah. Visual aid. Where are the programs getting their data to match against? Well, usually a facial recognition system has a database of photos that have already been run through a neural net, meaning they're already translated into math, into multidimensional coordinates. A neural net. I love it. Yeah. A neural net. Now, if I have a database and I know that this mathematical representation looks like Liz O'Sullivan, then I can also take this new photo and try to figure out how close that vector space is to the resulting vector space of my new photo. If it's very close, then yes, it might be Liz. If they're very far apart, it's likely it's somebody else. People are starting to realize exactly how powerful this tool is, and in some cases we're finding out that law enforcement and federal agencies have been using it for some time without our knowledge or consent. Uh -oh. That's scary. Yeah. That is so scary. In a lot of cases, we're finding out that this technology doesn't work as well on people of color or women or, um, you know, gender fluid or non-binary people. So this is important now for us to take a moment to understand fully exactly what we want our civil liberties to look like in the U.S. Yeah. Ooh, and everywhere else. I was hitting my mute button. My bad. She, my uh, mute, mute button. Really casually threw that in there about yeah. civil liberties. It's pretty good. Like, yeah, that's the part that I'm most alarmed about. Talking about the facial recognition. Yeah. Hey, Chris Hansen's in our Twitch chat. Hey, what's up, Chris Hansen? How you doing? Healthytalkshow.com slash live. We're recording live. You want to come in the chat and at least tell us to have a seat. Awesome, Chris Hansen. Loved you to catch a predator, my friend. Really good show. But on with the sorry, sorry to break up the Oh yeah. The Okay, we needed a light on the this. I know, because now moving on from the I way know. these facial AI recognition systems are racist, now <laughs> New York Times, you're being watched right now. Well, actually, the story the story is called New York Times One Nation Tracked Long Piece about the New York about it's how you're being tracked all the time and how anybody can access this information now, and it's yeah. just getting kind of scary. 
So, really, really disturbing. Yeah, yeah, we got a lot of videos. We got a lot of stuff. First one, New York Times. You're being watched right now. This video opens up because everyone says, I have nothing to hide. Uh, 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 nothing yeah. to hide. Privacy doesn't matter. So the New York Times is saying, okay, well, how comfortable are you with these violations of privacy? So let's talk about level one, advertising. For a long time, advertising was an art of guesswork. The madmen could only hope that you were thirsty. But now they can tell exactly how you're feeling. To show you what I mean, I want to tell you about a little experiment we did. Here's our guinea pig. Hi. His name is Farhad Manju. I'm an opinion columnist at the New York Times, and I write about technology. Now, at the start of the year, he volunteered. Well, I was asked to volunteer to have all of my information tracked and then, you know, publish all of that in the newspaper. Using a special browser. Hopefully you got a raise for that one or a yeah. bonus or something, my friend, because you were a, you're a real trooper. Hats off to you. At the same time, everyone's giving away this information. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. So. <laughs> it's fine. But he's giving it directly to his employers. That's, uh. yeah. We were able to see what websites Farhad visited, but more importantly, what those websites could see about him. So I started the day on Google and did a search, and nine trackers were downloaded onto my computer. Yes, trackers. These are tiny text files or even just a pixel sometimes. And trackers do what it sounds like they do. They track you. They can get my IP address or the device I'm using or the screen size. They were able to determine my location very precisely. Next, I went to HuffPo and I was swarmed. The, the trackers kind of multiplied. There were dozens and dozens. Every site Far had visited, the trackers <laughs> followed This is him. ridiculous. Post, Google. Oh, yeah. The trackers just keep multiplying. Yeah. They, they, they don't stop. It, and the fact they're called trackers and they, it just doesn't bother anybody. Yeah. Is, is this why the browsers get really bloated too? With all yeah, because track? they're tracking you. All yeah. the websites are tracking you across platform. It's what they all do. Advertising, baby. Vanity Fair. By the way, you know all of this is happening to you right now, don't you? As you're watching this video. Uh oh. You're just not supposed to know about it. And they're just, the trackers are just kind of, you know, on my heels as I go around the web. Okay, so different companies know the model of your phone. Big deal. Well, it gets worse. With all of your private data, the trackers send it away to... Mostly advertising companies. So there's this gigantic digital marketplace where your personal information is auctioned off to advertisers. Your data's like one of these tuna, except instead of humans arguing over you, it's algorithms. It all happens in a split second every time you load a web page. The companies say this data's all scattered into many little pieces, and oh, so yeah. it stays anonymous. Of course it is. It's yeah. scattered, encrypted. Yeah, of course <laughs> it is. We, we keep your data safe. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. But in buying and selling to each other, the companies can assemble those pieces and begin to build complete profiles of you. They have kind of almost direct access to your subconscious. And that's where this gets kind of dark. Where companies once had to hope you were in the mood to buy, now they can use your data to predict your mood and take advantage of it. That is, Would you be okay if a company... That's really disturbing and yeah. such manipulation. They can manipulate you to buy products and that's what they do. Yeah. Look at Amazon. Look at everything. Well, yeah, at one point Amazon. Amazon <laughs> Prime. Got everybody to buy crap. Company could tell you were depressed because of the food you just ordered. Or if your health insurance provider could raise your premiums because it knew you skipped too many days at the gym. That's the scary one. That's oh, yeah. the one that nobody wants to think about. The insurance companies. All this crap. Tracking cars. All this crap. Eventually, yeah. you're just going to get speeding tickets for going too fast or not wearing your seatbelt. You're going to get an insurance. Oh, you used your cell phone too much. These insurance companies are installing apps on phones now yeah. to track their users to see if you're a good driver if you use your phone while you're driving too much. That's weird. Yeah, and with all these insurance company algos that are supposed to be saving you money. No, they're not. They're just they're using your information to charge yeah, you. Yeah, to make money. <laughs> they don't want to save you money. They want to make money. That's all they care about. What about if your rideshare app was monitoring your phone's battery? There's nothing stopping them from using that information to jack up prices that is messed up. and most desperate for a ride. The companies have all Scary. of this information about you, and legally. I mean, you agreed to it in those terms and conditions you didn't read. It's nothing short of mind We're all control. guilty of that one. 
Yeah, the terms and conditions are yeah. really long. Yeah, so no one wants to read that. Yeah, it's bull crap. We all know Make we them all simple. Hit, yes. Make them simple. Level two of the privacy of what level Uh-oh. you're comfortable with. We're <laughs> I was gonna crank it up. I was already really yeah. uncomfortable. <laughs> Using your information to sell you ads and control you to buy crap. What's the next level? Level two. Photography. The technology the police are using these days, well, it's gotten a bit more sophisticated than this. This next story starts in Bryant Park, Midtown, New York, on a Tuesday lunchtime. That day was a typical late winter day. Well, not that typical. Our New York Times opinion reporters were busy collecting footage from the public webcams in the park. We ran it through facial recognition software, and that software scanned nearly 3,000 faces in the footage and matched them against a collection of publicly available images. And it didn't take long to find a match. That is me. For this guy. I'm Dr. Richard Madonna. I'm a professor at the SUNY College of Optometry. I had an email and a voicemail from the New York Times. What it said was, were you in Bryan Park last Tuesday at one o'clock? So I went to my calendar and sure enough, it said one o'clock Bryan Park Grill. In case you're wondering, all of this is legal and the software costs us less than $100 on Amazon. That was a- So they tracked this guy down with the piece of $100 software? Yeah. Through hmm. public cameras, facial recognition. What the hell? Yeah, and we we all understand how they were. Wow, <laughs> able to do it. A right. little spooky. Now anyone can collect the biometric information of members of the public and dig into their lives. There was a picture of the side of my head taken from above. Clearly, it was enough to identify with my website picture, which was actually taken probably six or seven years ago. It's a bad picture. Now, maybe this is news to you, but law enforcement agencies figured this out 20 years ago. Today, they've got access to photographs of tens of millions of Americans, images they run against descriptions of suspects thousands of times a year. Researchers have told us there's a 50-50 chance your face is in that database. So what happens when someone who looks a bit like you commits a crime? Does it bother you that the photo from your driver's license puts you in an infinite police lineup? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Public spaces feel the same when you know you can't escape surveillance. Police stop people from covering their faces from facial recognition camera and find man 90 whatever that sign is after he protested. I don't know my currency signs. Now, obviously, this technology comes with potential benefits like catching criminals, but never before have law enforcement agencies had powers like this. And right now, there's no legislation that puts a limit on it. Why would there be? Yeah. (laughs) It's... Yeah, the government's using it. Yeah, everyone's everyone's using using it. it. Advertisers, everyone loves this. They love this data. They love the data. We're some unhealthy talk show. Our our facial recognition data is out there too. Oh, I know. But I've been scanned by federal... I've been... I'm already in systems. I've been live scanned. I've been freaking fingerprinted. I've been DNA'd. I've been everything. It is They've probed me several times. It's not... All right, was that the last uh, level? No, there's oh one more. Oh my God, there's, there's more. one Jesus. more level. <laughs> that are was you all... ready? No, no, that was scary. Are you ready scary. to get scared? Oh, we're going to get more scared. Here we go. This guy knew what it was like to live under constant surveillance. For more than a decade, FBI agents dug into his private life, wiretapped his home and his hotel rooms. Except, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. was no criminal. He was just advocating for civil rights. The government didn't like that, so they went looking for information to discredit him. Governments have always been looking at people. That's not something that's <laughs> that's new. This is uh, Kara Swisher, by the way. I'm a contributing opinion writer for The New York Times, and I'm a longtime technology journalist. Anytime the government can overreach in terms of surveilling citizenry, they have done in the history oh. of the world. And the- I that's love that. Right? Just, yeah. yeah. She says all cap. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And she's yeah. Kara Swisher. She's a very reputable tech journalist, technology journalist. Mm-hmm. This is funny the way she just says it because she's yeah. just so aware of it. Yeah, it happens all the time because I, I, I look at this stuff all the time. <laughs> Last time, it wasn't that long ago. Taking details on that whistleblower who leaked top secret documents. I'm covering a massive government surveillance program. Oh, everyone already forgot about that. Use. When you call grandma Snowden. in Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. Everyone forgot about the Snowden papers. Oh, yeah. And the leaks. He knows. 
You know, a lot of people were surprised that the government was surveilling its citizens so extensively. I wasn't. What I think was surprising about what the stuff that Edward Snowden revealed was how extensive the government surveillance was. Extensive? The government had spent a whole decade reading the metadata on your emails, your texts, and your phone calls. There's an expression, why rob a bank? Well, that's where the money is. There's never been a time in history when more information about you was available because of information you willingly give up. And this hasn't stopped, by the yeah. way. The Patriot Act, which contains all of these powers, was quietly renewed again at the end of 2019. Can you imagine? He's talking about that Patriot Act. You want to talk about that being renewed? Is that on any any radar? It, it <laughs> no, si- it's, very it's not on any radar. Very silent. I also like what she said, that data you willingly gave up. Yeah, that's what you do. You, yeah. s- you sign the EULA. You agree. You, you are willingly giving up all this data. That's what's... And they're using it to spy on you. Yeah. Imagine today the ability to track Martin Luther King just if he had a cell phone, just if he appeared at a hotel, just if he moved through the world. Just imagine today's yeah. surveillance technology in the hands of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. They could have identified protesters, published their names, and intimidated them, all to keep them from marching in the streets. And as crazy as it seems... America might still look a lot more like this. This is why your privacy matters. Surveillance is a means of control and suppression. Ooh. 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 Yeah. Sure is. And we are being surveyed every day with our cell phones. Yeah. And we know where you're going, who yeah. you're pinging with. Yep. And compile all that. Oh, yeah. Cheddar. I don't know who they are, but they're a news organization. Pretty big one, too. Their set looks pretty cool. One Nation Tracked New York Times reveals investigation into biggest data leak. Writer Charlie Warzel comments. So uh, what we ended up finding in the in the trove was uh, roughly uh, 12 million or more uh, Americans uh, devices and uh, about 50 billion individual location pings. So it's uh, it's one of the largest uh, sets of this kind of information to ever be uh, provided to a journalist in some kind of way. And, and uh, w- this was provided to us uh, explicitly in order to, to uh, demonstrate the risks and vulnerabilities. The, the source who provided it to us was uh, very worried about this information, had spent time in it, and, uh, and, and was worried about the scope and the granularity and the fact that uh, they believed a lot of Americans didn't really have an idea that this was happening. So our hope in this series of pieces is to really show the stakes, to show the granularity, to show the breadth and depth of this and and how it it affects everyone from the president of the United States to, uh, you know, a stay at home mom to uh, kids in school. Yeah. Your privacy is important. Yeah. We need to keep it. Your data is important. Yeah. You and people are are important. People are manipulating. Ooh, getting you to buy stuff, getting you to feel certain ways about certain things. Yeah. Ooh. Cheddar. Why is this data collection allowed? Well, uh, one of the reasons why this information is allowed to be collected in the first place and also to be bought and sold and transferred to a lot of these third-party uh, data companies is because they say that, A, it's safe and secure, that it's not going to leak. Safe and secure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> safe and secure. Mean? It's not going to leak. As they sell it and repackage yep. it. It's safe. Don't worry. You won't get sick from it. <laughs> B, that, like you said, it's anonymous. And it's, uh, it's very clear that it's not anonymous. We were able to de-anonymize this data in a very short period of time. Um, the way that that sort of works is you isolate a device and you can see kind of the entire trail, right? Um, and you can immediately look for the two biggest clusters of pings. So uh, oftentimes that is where the person lives and where the person works. Um, and if they live in, say, a single family home, it's very easy to go back through public records to see who lives there and then uh, you know reference that with the workplace location. And if there's one or two more sort of breadcrumbs on social media or other public records, it's incredibly easy to um, to figure out who that is with with great certainty, as we found. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really scary. Makes sense, but people don't. I don't know that people realize how precise that location that is. Very precise. Yeah. And you know what the 
is saying, you know what all the application developers say, you know why they need this location? It's for your user experience. It's going to oh, help yeah. you. What's what you need? <laughs> so they asked what information is necessary for the best user experience. I think that's a great question. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's really a spectrum, right? I, I think a lot of people have reacted to this piece and this series of pieces saying, you know, I'm going to turn location services off for everything. And Great idea. I'm ready to throw away my phone. Oh, get, get some handheld radios. You don't need phones anymore. Great idea. You know, that, that's a choice that everyone can make, but there are things, turn-by-turn -turn directions, that are, that are actually quite useful as long as they're not left on, uh, you know, in perpetuity. But then there's this whole other layer, uh, which is, I think, what you're speaking to, and that is, you know, things like coupon apps, uh, weather apps. There are, you know, uh, streaming service apps uh, that all have the location services on. And it's not really clear that that's providing that much of a value. I mean, you can go and type in your zip code and get the weather for your zip code. You don't necessarily need to have location on. And we found... I think that's hilarious that you brought that up. Yeah. Because a lot of people have these weather apps. What? It's, Why? It's you just true. type in where you live. That's all it... Yeah. But you have that location data on. It's telling you where you're at in your house. It's yeah. It's really pinpointing you down. Same oh, thing yeah, with yeah. all these food ordering apps. No, I can type in my zip code yeah, of where I am. Exactly. Don't don't hone in on my location. I'll tell you where I'm at. Yeah. Give me a map. I'll put a pin in. That in some apps, especially some of the uh, lesser used ones, perhaps uh, they're taking your location uh, five to six times a minute. Uh, oh. So that yeah, five to six times a minute. What, a lot of these they, spying apps. Why do they need all that? They got to track it. They got to sell your data to the advertisers to tell they make money. How they make money? Got to make money. These apps—they're all free, but nothing's free. I mean, that kind of level of granularity is, is is really not worth it. And so, what we're what we're hoping is that the scope of this will really help people set their own permissions and start to evaluate, and then give the industry, you know, a, a kick to have a little more transparency. And hopefully, you know, lawmakers will will do something about that. No, 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 no. Lawmakers do not need to do anything about that. Yeah. More, tr we need to, as users, push for more transparency, open source. Yeah. That's what we need. Got to support the local devs, developers, you know. Uh, now, the last question, is Apple better than Android? Because everyone always, oh, Apple's better. They're better. <laughs> They're more private. Let's see what he says. That's, it's kind of tough to say. And, and, and this sort of speaks to the industry. The most frustrating thing about this is when you're trying to demystify this world, right? Where's the information going? Where is it coming from? Uh, trying to just draw like a flow chart for just a given app. It's nearly impossible. And we're, you know, we've spoken to dozens upon dozens of people in this industry and everyone describes it as the wild west or describes it as a black box and says, once the information goes here, it, it, it's kind of lost forever. And that's your uh, location data and your yeah. private information. Just FYI, that's your data. That's your it information gets, that they're just throwing into a hole and saying, okay, <laughs> screw you. But then other people can pull it out and say, ooh, this is useful. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's the problem. It gets replicated. It gets combined with who knows what other yep. data sets with your name and yep. information. Yep. In, and the ad industry is so complex that uh, everyone sort of knows a part of it, but they don't have the ability to zoom out and see the, the whole bird's eye view. So th that's part of the difficulty. You know, I, I think when you're talking about Apple or uh, Android, I think uh, Apple, especially with its focus on privacy, really needs to look into uh, the permissions that it's granting and the, and the ability to- I love the way, because he's, he's got, he's sent something up, he's thinking, well, we're talking about Apple. Yeah. And he's, he's laughing because it's laughable what these, what they allow. Yeah. It, to approve these it apps. Is, uh, no, it's it's weird. Why aren't yeah. they looking at these apps with more scrutiny? Well, how can you? Oh, I guess. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of uh, developer software that is embedded in a lot of these apps, which allows that data to be just kind of leaked out and uh, and given to third parties. And the problem is, and he talks about this and like, how do you avoid all this tracking and stuff? Oh, live in a hole bubble. It's the apps. Absolutely, yeah. 100%. It's the apps. The OSs are also tracking you. Google, iPhone, they're both tracking you too. But these apps are tracking you so much. Uninstall all of them. Do not use apps. Apps are tracking yeah. you. That is the real problem. 
Oh, the, your phone is tracking you too with the GPS chip, all that stuff. That is always tracking you too. Yeah, that's, Don't listen. that's kind of unavoidable. But yeah, you can't avoid that. But the apps are tracking you. I think that's the yeah. gist of this whole thing is these apps are just tracking the crap out of everybody. I don't know. There's, that's a, yeah, it's pretty disturbing. But yeah. definitely the more apps, the more replicated your data is yeah. everywhere. So. It's worse in China, though. Much oh, worse yeah. in China. We're going to cover that maybe next episode. Yeah, but I think a little we'll sneak have preview. It's a... Some more stuff Ooh, is coming out worse. about the War, basically yeah. police surveillance state that China's becoming. Yeah, where we're going if we continue if, down this yeah. path of mass surveillance. And I think that's the point of this. Mm-hmm. Is, and he kind of brought up this other uh, good issue that, oh, well, no one has the full picture. But mm-hmm. I think the problem is people want that full picture. So people keep trying to collect more and more and more yeah. data. Who it, wants the full picture? The advertisers? The, everybody. Everybody. The advertisers, the government. Government, law enforcement. Yeah, everybody. they're all trying to get it. The Martians. Everybody. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wanted to attack us, yeah. we put all our data well, out our, there. Yeah, it's all there. Just, <laughs> Just go and get it. buy it. Yeah. yeah, you know all of our weaknesses. <laughs> Basically. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you ready to oh, check just, out? One more oh, thing, yeah. just kind of tying everything back together, because mm-hmm. with being tracked to, and then we have this bias, so n- now this could also kind of lead to more biases against either minorities mm-hmm. being tracked and, you know, being targeted by law enforcement. Yeah, and kind of that video another. said with Martin Luther King, he was being yeah. tracked by the FBI for a very long time, not just because of his stance on the civil rights. New York Times left this, left this part out, but actually on his stance on the Vietnam War, he was anti what was going on in the Vietnam War. Yeah. And I like the draft. And so they really did not like that too much either because he was a big voice against that. He was a good... Yeah. Yeah. And so then that brings up the issue. So what if you support something controversial? Yeah. And then... who They're who, just going to spy on you and... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or who's ever interested in being against you is going to have be mm-hmm. able to easily access your information because anyone can buy it. Yeah, right now, so. nobody likes Donald Trump, but Donald Trump is the president, and guess what? All that information, he's the president. So, again, yeah. think about that. Let's well, just all think about this information. And then on It's the, going everywhere. Yeah, and but if the Democrats want to take back power, they could also, you know, <laughs> both, both parties can use it yeah. against people. Oh, yeah. There's no control. Knowledge is power. Yeah. That's why they want to hold these publications and research articles hostage, That's, kind of. Yeah, at least. Knowledge is power. That's what it seems like. Yeah, well, we're checking out Love and Light. So here at Healthy Talk Show, we're not interested in trying to track you or sell you crap. We're not selling your data to advertisers. We don't have mailing lists. All we ask for putting this information out there is for your love and support in return. So head on over to HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Give us some love there. Yes, or ask at healthytalkshow.com. That's our email. We record Healthy Talk Show live on Mondays and now Fridays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC over at healthytalkshow.com slash live. Love and light. Love and light.